three families are about to go back in time. I feel almost like I've been sentenced to five months hard labor. You could have the best intentions of coming out and, and starting a life here, and before you know it, you're bust. It's not quite as charming as it once was, and Garden Eden has turned into hell. Fictionalized, mythologized, often romanticized. Now, see the real experience of life on the frontier. Funding for Frontier House is provided by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation to enhance public understanding of the role of technology. The foundation also seeks to portray the lives of the men and women engaged in scientific and technological pursuit. Corporate support is made possible by Bob's Red Mill Natural Foods, makers of over 400 stone ground whole grain products for every meal of the day. Our all-natural products are available at your local grocer or natural foods market. Bob's Red Mill Natural Foods, to your good health. And by Georgia Pacific. Life on the frontier would have been different with GP brands like Quilted Northern Bath Tissue, Brawny Towels, and Dixie Cups and Plates. Georgia Pacific. We make the things that make you feel at home. Major funding is provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Late August in Frontier Valley, and our homesteaders have been hard at work for four months. The three families, the Clunes, Justin, more wood is split. The Glens, you all think yours are big. Look at this. And the Brooks have been isolated from the modern world. My hope when I applied for this project was that my family would learn that they had to depend on family and not on friends and not on other things to take their attention. Did your face hurt? Huh? It's killing me. Since their arrival, the families have faced a unique challenge learning to live together without 21st century distractions. <laughs> Anya and Tracy, they've gone a little wilder since they've been out here. Wild and more like animal wild. The girls went and built their own secret fort and they spend every night there. They're happy and I'm happy because we, we got a little separation there. Those teenage girls need just a little bit of a breakout and that kind of made a difference. That made, in fact, Fantastic difference. <laughs> Newlyweds, Nate and Kristen, are on an extended honeymoon. Unlike the other families down the valley who have children to care for, they are all alone on the frontier. It's the love shack. <laughs> um, it's interesting because I realized since we've been out here that we're never alone like this. It's so quiet out here, you know? Every time in the rest of my life I've either been in... Oh, it's hard to say. <laughs> I can't say it on camera. Just, yeah, but just, just the, <laughs> the wheels nodding. Apartment buildings, hotel rooms, dorms, they're all like, there's people around all the time. You know what I mean? And when you're out here, there's nobody around. So that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> In the 1880s, a young couple would not have enjoyed this kind of privacy for long. <laughs> this is our family. Nate, our family Kristen, portrait. and the goat. Yeah. That's, our, that's our kid. Oh, come on, that's Just right. me and Glowbug <laughs> sitting on a log. Me and Glowbug. She's like a dog. <laughs> <laughs> me and my Glowbug. <laughs> Just hanging out. <laughs> Me and my blow bug. Make me want to shop. Go into daddy again. Go nozzle into daddy. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Homestead families with six to 12 children were common. Without having kids out here, I think we have a heck of a lot less work to do. Adrian has to 
cook constantly because she needs to keep the food supply up constantly. Whereas we're just completely free. We can do whatever we want, which I think is is an advantage. But, but I mean, I'm trying to think of an advantage of having the kids. They have extra hands. I think that's why um, families had more and more kids. Back in 1883, it just would have been a pool of basically slave labor. They would have been, you know, worked to an extent that we, we don't think about working uh, children today. Nine-year-old Connor Clune's main activities used to revolve around TV, video games, and paintball battles. But here, things are different. I just wanted to go home the first day out here because it was just so hard. I just think we're really in the shoes of our ancestors, but these shoes suck. Pioneer living has cramped the California lifestyle of the Clune family particularly Gordon and Adrienne, whose romance has been strained by close quarters shared with four children. Adrienne and I you know, have a really very good relationship in the 21st century, but the contrary happened out here. We basically were strangers. Teenagers Anya and Tracy are struggling with the realities of their new lifestyle. All they did was work and get slaved around. Like the kids are basically just made to like help help out with all the chores and everything like that not very much fun being a slave 12 year old justin a straight a student at home has been hard at work from the start side by side with his father gordon he is becoming the second man of the family i didn't really think of this as like a big long summer vacation because obviously we're not really kicking back and relaxing. <laughs> Just up the valley, Karen and Mark Glenn from Tennessee have found life in a one-room cabin with Karen's two children stressful. You don't need it, your own zero. Zero, shut up. Zero, shut up. Well, that's soft, Mark. Despite the tensions, 12-year-old Erin is thriving on the frontier. She's discovered she has a knack for taking care of animals, but it's not exactly Little House on the Prairie. You work a lot and you don't look pretty at all, never, and you never have your hair braided like Laura Ingalls Wilder did, because you never have time for that. An eight-year-old Logan has also been given daily chores, most importantly, caring for the livestock and hauling water, responsibilities he never had in modern life. Work took over. My only friend here is work. You met him yet? No. Y'all are 21st century lackers. A visitor to the West in the 1870s was shocked to report that childhood was nearly extinct on the frontier. Children as young as three were put to work. Every hand was needed for a homestead to succeed. We dammed up the small little like creek and we dug like um, canal that will lead to the garden and it'll um and that way we won't have to go get like tons of buckets of water to water the garden that, this is really hard well that's why i got you to do it you're the digger I worry that I might be a little too severe on them, and I worry that I might drive them to hate this place, but for their own good and for the good of the family, we have to get these chores done. Oh, that's like a 500 pound rock. I think my mom and dad have been strict with me because they just huh? wanted me to really teach me a lesson about life, because ahead of time I thought this would be easy. But then, when I got to that point, I knew the person who had to do that was one tough bugger. At the Glens, Logan has been taking care of the chickens and gathering valuable eggs. Well, I have to be the chicken man. I have to take care of all the stuff. Not, I'm just like the master of the company. I can't let my company go out of business. He's about to face a grim reality. She hasn't laid. That's the problem. 
if they lay, they stay, because we know they'll lay again. If she hasn't laid, and it's too late, she takes her life again. Well, don't you go listen? You go pick up Bashful and you go in there and play with Bashful, okay? I know. I know. You know what? We can always get more chickens, can't we? It's a chicken. One of my chickens. One of all my Look. Look up here. Shh. Come on. It's okay. I love you. You're tired and you're hot. Go get him some water, sweetheart. It's okay. Shh. It's okay. Come on. I spend enough time in my head thinking about me and Nate and our stuff. I can't imagine if I was taking on three or four of my children's needs as well. I just, I'd be so, it would be hard. It would be really hard with kids out here. It's terrifying to picture being pregnant out here, having the baby out here. What do you do when that crawling age, you know, when the baby's crawling and lifting himself up on stuff? And this just isn't the environment for a kid to be <laughs> crawling around down here. It, makes, it would make me a little nervous, especially with the wood stove. I think there were probably 80 mice in here last night. They were scampering all over the floor. They were on the walls. They were on the shelves. It's disgusting. It, it just... Oh. Cabin life was dirty and dangerous for babies. One out of every five children didn't survive infancy due to disease. And a mother dying in childbirth was tragically common. Possibly I could have a kid like in March or April or something like that, which would be the dead of winter. What if Nate and I were here in this cabin and I died in childbirth? I mean, what does he do with me? <laughs> you know, I mean, it's morbid, but it's an interesting thought. Surprisingly, country life in the 1880s was safer for kids than life in the cities. Infectious disease was the leading cause of death for children and exposure was heightened by overcrowded and unsanitary conditions. But living with sharp tools, hot stones, and large farm animals was risky for kids. Even the smallest injury could become infected and prove fatal. Antibiotics would not be invented for another 60 years. Let's see, let me get... Can I get some clean water, okay? Really big. Um, saw yeah, I saw could have chopped your toe off too. Could be worse. So you shouldn't be doing that kind of work without your boots on. I have something wrong with my feet. They're all scratched up and cracking. And it feels like my big toe's gonna fall off. Because there's cracking in between. And then I also have these really bad blisters from the new shoes. Pioneer families also feared wild animals. These mountains were inhabited by coyotes, mountain lions, and bears. You see it? Yeah, but look at the cows. Compare the size. Um, there are reports that there was uh, a dead cow down and that they had been seeing bear. And we just spotted it, and it's, I mean, it's within view of our cabin. Well, I've got one of the cubs up here feeding on the cow carcass. And right up above it, into the trees, you can see some dark spots and a little bit of movement. I'm glad that we got a visual on one, so that, to the kids, makes it very real. You know, they can see it, they can see what it's doing, and they can understand that you have to be careful. These are strange and wild woods that we live in, and we can't assume that it's um, some nice little farm, that it's such a controlled setting that things can't happen. The bears are moving closer. A brown bear has discovered the girl's fort, 
right next to the Kloon cabin. It's tearing down their fort. Oh god, we gotta get the girls. Oh, it. It's like this the honeybush. in there. I see it, I see it, I see it. We heard wolves the other night, and it was probably close by to the glens. And they all have sheep. So I'm not sleeping there tonight. That's awfully close for comfort here, right by the outhouse. So I don't, I don't use our outhouse late at night anymore. <laughs> Well, a little excitement, huh? These bears are everywhere. With bears around, the families are keeping closer to home. Well, we get really bored and some, I don't know, from being a teenager out in the frontier, it's probably not a good age to be out in the frontier unless... Well, I mean, around our age, we would have been getting married and... Yeah, we'd probably be having our own families by now, but it's not really happening out here. <laughs> For everyone, frontier life has led to frontier fever. The blue witch is definitely here. Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh, I swear to say. I'm sorry. Their video diary camera has become a means of entertainment. Get the mice out of the house! We don't want no stinking mice! Too many mice in the house! Here, I have them. It really hurts right here. It's like, you should see what it did to me. <laughs> my name is Olga. I'm from Norway to meet my pioneer cousins. I like to make hay. Would you like to make hay with me? The only way children could escape the homestead was school. Here, even in 1883, an education was required by law. So the Clooms and the Glens have asked a local expert to help them explore their options. I'm Gordon Kloon. Gordon, I'm Judy Harding. Nice, nice to meet you. Judy Harding, who has taught for 25 years, has been researching public education in Montana and discovered it came with restrictions. What are the laws that we found interesting? No children of African descent could go to your public school. We have an African-American family here in our community already, and we adore them. And I don't think anyone at this table would ever not want them to have the same rights and, and education opportunities that our children have. We'd want them to be educated along with our yeah. children. We'd want that. Do we decide if Nate and Kristen kids can go to school? Yeah. Is it going to be against the law? Probably, but it's still our community. Why the hell do we leave and come up here if we're going to have somebody telling us what to do against what we feel? Well, Mark, I have some good news for you. You can decide that for yourself. You're right about that. That's what you would like to be able to do up here, and you can. Your option would be to do just a conscription sort of thing where you come up with some funds and you hire a teacher. Our families have made the decision to have a private school. You don't have any support from the government. Everything has to come from you. So that's good news, bad news. You get to do what you want, but you have to pay for it yourself. I'd be curious to know what you might charge for this. Good. I think we need to, to talk about that. In 1883, the average salary for a female teacher was $54.50. Had I been born male, you would have to then pay me $71.40. So again, nothing has changed. <laughs> yeah. Men still make more money for mm -hmm. the same work. Mm -hmm. So we really haven't evolved like we like to think we have. The other things remaining would be the building. So that's something to think about. Where could you hold school? The families find a shed on the edge of Frontier Valley. It's a mile walk from the homesteads. But in the 19th century, it was not uncommon for pioneer children to travel 15 miles a day to attend school. 
This is the only structure available. Otherwise, the families will have to build from scratch, which would be costly and time-consuming. We could do a window in one day, easy. Uh, Once all went, if we had the materials sitting here, one window a day, another one I could do it with you got new sweat. What about the floor? Yeah. You know, leave it like that, just dirt? Yeah. It would cost a fortune. Right. Yeah, oh. it would. It would cost a fortune putting your roof on. Even the roof. Adrian? Oh, oh, neat. Yeah. Is it wasp nest? Yeah, like a paper wasp. Oh, yeah. See, look at that kind of honeycomb pattern. It seems like a lot more work than we expected, I think. It won't be easy to have it ready in a week. It's a lot more than I thought we'd have to do. In the spirit of community, Nate offers his carpentry skills. You could turn this front part into the kind of school and a nice more formal school setting with benches and maybe a desk for The other families tell him about the racist laws that would have prevented his children from attending the same public school as white children. Racial discrimination existed in 1883. I'm sure it was very prevalent here in the Montana territories, but that doesn't change the fact that the people who we are today in this modern world, we're not, we're not 1883 couples. You know, we're, we're living an experiment. It just shocked me because I haven't experienced racism firsthand yet. And I've experienced it through Nate's stories. Um, but I didn't even, it didn't even dawn on me. And to have someone say, we're not going to let your kid in. I realized my kid, oh my, oh my kid, oh gosh, this is going to affect me and my family. I'm naive, but I haven't made that connection really yet. Um, plus it's 2001 and as in my circles, it's dead. You know, we don't talk about that. That's not an issue. You know, I, I think it's it's scary when we look back at an 1883 history book and we get to laugh at it and say, oh, God, we've come so far and, you know, we, we certainly don't do this anymore. When it's the racism or the prejudice or the stereotypes are still there, they're, they're just subtle. Like, I wonder what it would really be like for us, you know, because... I think it was a much huger issue, and it would have been black, black then, you know. But we're all 2001 people, so we're just like, ah, love. The good thing about going to school is I won't have to churn butter until Saturday and Sunday. Okay, that one's done, basically, you know. Except for the right Yeah. I think I need a little bit of, uh, like, trip away from the cabin, you know, I think everybody's going a little crazy out here. Oh, yeah. Everybody yeah. was coming. <laughs> <laughs> now y'all have to teach the grown-ups to work some muscle up. <laughs> Instead of us just getting these big ones. It looks good. That looks really good. Yeah, we're gonna fix that one that Gordon helped us with. <laughs> School, you'll always have something new, because you never do the same thing over or the next once. This is great. I love how much light is coming in there. We got seven or eight weeks left in our, in our project. Five of those weeks are going to be taken up in education, and to them, that's a vacation. Going to school is a good thing. I mean, it's good for the parents, and it's good for the children. It's like a, a kid's playhouse, almost, instead of a schoolhouse, you know, with the low door openings and you know, the long windows and like all that. Yeah. The kids are always working around here. It's just going to fall apart. Judy Harding has arrived. In 1883, many teachers would have taught and lived in the schoolhouse or stayed with a neighboring family. Everything's perfect. It's just perfect. Good teachers were hard to find. Standards were low, and teaching certificates were not required. In the 1880s, 70% of teachers were women. Schoolmistresses as young as 15 were commonplace. Many came west to teach, even though the pay was low and the turnover frequent. It was one of the only respectable jobs available to single women. I always said that before I totally quit, 
this profession. I would love to teach in a one-room schoolhouse. And to find one like this, I never, ever thought I'd do. It's so authentic and it's beautiful. Can't wait to see the kids. Well, be good. Take care of your brother. Don't let him fall off that horse. It is the first day of Frontier School. Most children in Montana Territory went to school for only five months each year since they were needed to help out on the homesteads during planting and harvesting. Our school term will last for five weeks. Five weeks, one month, and then the project's over. And the school is really making you realize that. It's kind of sad. So good to see you, Justin. Come on, nice to see you. A hat and everything. Judy will teach the children lessons from the 1880s, but she will also include modern material so they don't fall behind. They are missing more than two months of classes in their 21st century schools. Now, when we start our, our class today, we're going to start it as you would have in 1883. Every morning they'd start with a memory gem. Who can read it for me? Would you, Anya? No one believes a liar. Excellent elocution she has, isn't it? Now, the other thing that they always did in opening exercises is they'd sing songs. I could teach you eight verses of this, but I'm not going to. One of the difficulties of the one-room schoolhouse is that every age group is together, but they're at different levels. The real problem with this is, of course, that you don't have enough time to do all the recitations for all the children. So get it into as few groups as possible. 132. Mm -hmm. The younger children need more teacher-taught things than the older children do. They're not as able to work on their own. And so by having the, the older children both make materials, like make flashcards for them, and then use those things to help them practice their multiplication tables. So it really filled in that gap. You don't know this one? Yeah, I do. What is it? 21. 121. There's 4,000 kids at high school. And like each classroom contains like 30 to 40 people in the class. And it's like really hard to pay attention because like the teacher, if you, they only say it once, and if you don't get it, then oh well, you don't get it. With the children in school from eight until three, the rhythm of homestead life has changed. Some pioneer parents disregarded the law, preferring to have their children work rather than learn. I got food. I got food for you. In 1883, nearly 45% of the children in Montana did not attend school. But some parents understood the value of an education. This is their ticket out of here, not just temporarily. Temporarily, yes, their ticket out of a lot of chores during the day. But it's also their ticket out of here. If this was really 1883, they see you could have this lifestyle, live like this. Or 2001, they could live um, like this. Yeah, or even in 2001. Or you can get an education and you have choices. Mothers still want, in families, want the best for their kids. It's just, when you love them <laughs> too much, I guess, like I do, it's, it's personally, it's very, very hard to cut those apron strings. With the kids gone to school, that we have just so much privacy now. It's wonderful. I mean, first time in three months, you know, you just have the cabin to yourselves and it's quiet. But it was nice rolling in the hay with you. It was great. For Karen, peace and quiet has a downside. Gotten so spoiled. 
by having Logan and Aaron around here all the time that um, I'm going to miss them so terribly. And it's, it's selfish of me. I, it's very selfish of me. I understand that. But they're my comrades. They're at sometimes my best cheerleaders and supporters. And um, I, it just, to me, that's devastating. It's like I'm losing my best friends. Good job. Very good. The first day of school, I hated it because it felt like preschool and kindergarten put together. It was, was like, really boring and I hated it. And we were learning like how to add, and it was just like, like this is like not like our grade. And it was really embarrassing when we had to sing Polly Wally Doodle all day. I thought it was fun. You would. <laughs> <laughs> the lessons for me are too easy. I don't, I don't really feel like I'm learning anything, and I'm not being challenged at all. I thought it was cozy. It was a good school. It was a good outhouse. I broke it in. Did the first one in it. Do you have drinks out there? Yeah. Okay. Is that what you're saying? Yep. Yep. Where's mom's drink? No, tell me what you think of school. You think it's hard enough? It's just, I don't think Erin thinks it's hard enough because she hadn't got to reading group with her. You know, like, but every day she knows that me and Connor are like low grade and that's when they usually hold you back at low grade. Uh huh. So we're doing math and thing every day, so it's just like back home. Hmm. I know you think it's easy now, but I'm sure it's going to get quite a bit more difficult. Or maybe you'll start. Tutoring, on, yeah. well, I think our philosophies on raising children come between the two of us. I don't think I want to be anybody's stepfather. It's just a really bad position to be in, and I, it's one I don't think I want to be in anymore. I mean, we've always gotten along with just her and I, always. But there are too many variables in life. You can't be alone with somebody, especially when you marry a woman with two kids. It'd be nice if it was a four-member team. But it's a three-member plus one team. And he sets it up like that. He, uh, for whatever reason, I don't know why he likes me. He likes me, but he doesn't like being around the kids. So, that's too bad. Because I'm not a me. I am a mom with two children. That's the package. And so, if he can't take the package, he can't just have one piece of the toy out of the package. Two weeks into school, Judy decides to inspire the children with an archaeology lesson. This is all the stuff we found, some charcoal, something that looks like a can in tooth, or an arrowhead, a whole bunch of snails, and we found some weird rocks. People have definitely been here, snails have definitely been around for a long time, and most likely people there was people living here since we found the charcoal or having a campfire here. Here. It was okay. real different what I thought it was going to be. I thought we were going to be sitting there listening to one of the kids talk, listening to math stuff that's in the seventh grade and all this stuff. And I was like, oh my God, I am going to hate school. It turned out to be the funnest thing in life. Although archaeology wouldn't have been taught in 1883, Music and art were being introduced alongside more traditional lessons. One, two, three, Judy has taken this one step further and is teaching the children to play the guitar. When I first came out here, I didn't really think much about the one-room schoolhouse. And it was like no big deal to me. I didn't really think about it. I was really happy that she taught us the guitar. I really like music. Yeah. It got better because we started like doing like more things like that would be in our age group. And me and Lonnie got to sit next to each other and then we started learning how to play the guitar. And then we didn't have to learn how to add anymore. And it just changed. Mm. Oh yeah, here. Let's just a cheeseburger. 
Oh, I have ice on my plate and cakes. I thought I'd drink French fries. French fries. French fries. Mm. Mm. A cheeseburger. I have just normal lunches at school. Potato chips and Coke mm. and donuts. Uh, Why do you get so fat when you get back? I miss guys. Really bad. Me too. I haven't seen a hot guy in about... Hey, what? <laughs> <laughs> no offense, anybody? Five months. Like... I miss guys too. Yeah, Especially the ones that are hot. <laughs> <laughs> Take them my dumb hot. Hey, look at that. Let me see it. It's fantastic. This is what you found? That's obsidian. No, I made that. You made this? That's a beautiful piece of obsidian. Let me see that. There's this Ooh, big one. Look at that yeah. one. I've never seen our children this excited about going to school. They are so enthusiastic. <laughs> the books are something that, that are like a recreation almost for them. It's something they can open and read and learn something. It's wonderful. It's, it's this quest for knowledge that, you know, it's been there before, but nothing to the extent that we're seeing now. I've gotten better with my dad and it's good because every time when I'm at my house, only once a week or something, I'd be able to really see him very like often. By the time I go to bed and everything, he'd be coming home eating his dinner and everything. And he's always doing his business things. But now he teaches me a whole bunch of more things like how to fish better, how to cast, tie my own hooks and things like that. And I just think it's better to, for that to happen because I just didn't get a chance for him to teach me anything else back at home. I just want I just want to like him to teach me more things and I wanna be just like him when I grow up. Oh. Good job, Dad. Well we got ourselves a beauty. Pull, pull, rope right off and went right in the water. You know what? I didn't say good job, you guys, for bringing home the fish. Oh, you did. Oh, you my guys goodness. did a That's great why... job today. Girls, are you going to have soup? Is uh, that vegetable yes, soup from, yes, the, from the garden for vegetables? I feel we've definitely spent much more time with our children here and become much closer than we would have back in the 21st century. You just spend so much time together and you do so much together. It's a vegetable soup. It's similar to what my grandma Ochi used to make. I've completely connected with them and they appreciate me more and I appreciate them more and just love them tremendously. A lot more than I, I probably ever could have because of the, the experiences that we've grown together and doing together here. We've really gotten to know our children really well. And I think they got to know us a bit more, too. Don't know if that was good or not. <laughs> but I think it was. Overall, it was good. And, you know, Ada and I are probably a little bit overly preoccupied with each other in the 21st century. You know, we're afforded, we, you know, we're able to do that, and we're a romantic couple, and we're so preoccupied with each other that the children probably were more secondary. A new issue has arisen in Frontier Valley. The Glens have been taking care of the Clune's horse, Cowboy, and Karen wants them to pay. Gordon has refused on the grounds that the Glens have been riding his horse. His unique solution is to eliminate the debt by giving them a new bed. Well, this way more than compensates for my beholding to Mark. And my beholding is to Mark, not to anyone else. 
Um, and I'm making this for Mark. What Mark wants to do with it, Mark wants to give it to her and say that he builds it, good for him. Maybe he'll actually get to test out the spring action on this sucker. I doubt it, though. I doubt, I doubt anyone would want it. You just pick it up by the post if you can. And we're going to walk through the riverway. The riverway is shorter. We'll get a few wet, but it's not too, not too deep these days. Connor, can you open up the gate? Hello, Karen. Hello, Aaron. I have a surprise for Mark. So, I'd like to deliver our surprise to him. You just never know what's going to happen around here, do you? Yeah. I avoid her as much as possible. I just stay, keep my distance. But I do have interaction with Mark, and we kind of get along. I mean, we're not best friends or anything, but we kind of get along. Right. Okay, so this is what I had to work with. This is the wood we did. It's, yeah. it's plain. Yeah. Got some holes put in it. Yeah. 120 foot of rope. I hope you good. hope you use it. I hope you like it. Good luck. Thank you, Gordon. Take care, Mark. That looks sure. good. What are you up to? Just something, you know, Mark and I, we have things going on, and I gave him something, and I think he's happy with it. Good luck. Men must play by some set of rules that are just, like, bizarre. Yeah, that's good for him. Because when, you, when you're straightforward, then you're stupid. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, and everything goes around the corner, and then, then I'm supposed to be thankful. But no one has said anything to me, and yes, I think I deserve that. You know? Ouch, yeah. Oh, well. It was a nice gesture. It was real sweet. But when he said he was giving it to Mark, I thought maybe Mark was going to start sleeping outside or something. You know, it was just really odd. I wouldn't have given a bed to just Adrian. This has been going on between Gordon and Karen since, since Virginia City. And it's been, you know, it's it's been going on between the two families. Christ, I can't even eat supper without having a clean conversation, which I don't care anything about. Well, they've got this or they've got that or where did they get it? Or they have this nicer thing or... or this or that, you know? And Christ, I, I'm so ashamed. I sometimes get caught up in it, too. But it's all been positioning. You know, it's all been, who's better than who? Well, you know what? Out here, no one's better than anybody else out here. I have kind of nicely on his part. And uh, nicely on your part. Being gracious in both ways. Well, no, he did say it was for you. He, he was very clear about that. You know what? That kind of comment right there is stupid. That's a stupid comment, Karen. I probably can't build a bed that good. Uh, what's it matter? It doesn't. My mother had always told me, don't waste your time hating anybody. Because the only one that it hurts is yourself. They usually don't feel the pain. And that's true. Because I probably have wasted a lot of good energy and just angry tones towards Gordon that it didn't hurt anybody but myself. It does change my perception of the man. Um, I can't say well, that we're going to be chums, and I can't say that we're going to be buddies. But I can say that um, I can be softer. I've been a bit rough, and I've probably been a bit harsh. And I've probably enjoyed some of his um, follies, maybe a little too much. And so, in that respect, I don't know that it will change the relationship, but it has changed me. On September 8, 1883, a major event took place that revolutionized life in Montana. The Northern Pacific Railroad finally met linking the Northern Territories to the rest of the country. This transformed the lives of homesteaders, making travel, information, and goods more easily available. And this meant a lot to everybody. We finally had, of course, a railroad in Montana. That's what we're thinking about. But it was so much more than that. So what we have to celebrate, oh my gosh. Yeah. that finally the train has made a connection. I have for each of the three tables one beautiful orange. This is gold. This is their first orange in five months. 
Hey, it actually tastes good. It does? It tastes better than what else you can eat. As you're digging into your beautiful orange, remember that even though we now have the means to get them here, they are going to be very expensive because you have to pay for that freight. So this orange would be quite an expensive delicacy in your family budget. This is hot. At the Glen Cabin, Logan is having a bath. Tomorrow is his ninth birthday, and Karen has a big surprise planned for him. It stinks, Logan. Your hair stinks. Hey, well, you know, What's this? it proves that it'll work. Yeah, right. It's a signal. It shows my personality. Yeah. Why would you call me and in the name if I was one? What would I call you? I was thinking I'd be called Eagle Eyes. Eagle Eyes? Yeah, that's a good name. Because, you know, because I'm always looking. Uh-huh. I'm always biting things. Or he talks too much. No! <laughs> <laughs> you think Eagle Eyes would be good? Here, Eagle Eyes, hold that on your eyes so you don't get any soap in them, okay? Got it? Or Ow! Hi! You do that on purpose. Oh, I don't. Yeah, right. How about boy who smells like dog? <laughs> I'd like bear better. Boy who smells like bear? <laughs> Mama, give me a real name. I'm trying to be oh, serious. I'm trying to be serious. I'm sorry. Logan's birthday is here, but no present yet. And we got word that it was coming in. Mama told me that I was getting something special. And I was like, is it strong? Can I play with it? Will I have it forever? And she would always answer, answer yes or no. And I was like, I'm trying to find out what it is. Uh, <laughs> Ow. Hey, I'm under here, you know. The railroad made it easier and cheaper to travel out west. Okay. You can look. <laughs> Karen's mom has come all the way from Tennessee. They've not seen each other in over four months. God, I'm so glad you're here. You like your present? Thank you. I thought you could play with it. <laughs> you look great. You look so I miss wonderful. you all so much. Oh, gosh. It's been horrible. I, I've never been this far away from you. I said you will never go again. It's <laughs> <laughs> Well, sweetie, how you doing? Old woman. How are you? Pretty good. Pretty good. Well, come in. Karen's mom and dad lived a rural life, not far removed from the homestead experience. And Karen is eager to make her mother proud. This is our home. Granny, you got here on the day we pulled our first potatoes up. Yeah, I oh, some really? potatoes this morning. Uh-huh. How They're, nice. They, they turned out pretty ugly. <laughs> That's my birthday boy. <laughs> there you go. Oh, heaven forbid. <laughs> it's the best birthday present I could ever have, Mom. <laughs> Slingshot. Oh, cool. One for Aaron and one for you, honey. And took Goliath down. Yeah. <laughs> and he said you could use stones with them. It's the best. I think Granny's more excited than you are, Logan, to see you over. Logan is lucky. Yes. Granny has brought him several handmade toys. Frontier children oh. would never have gotten so many gifts, as birthday presents wouldn't become a popular tradition until after the turn of the century. When I was telling you about this, I thought that you would feel real good about me doing this because of all my experiences with you and Daddy. Yes, I know, but everything that you was used to having and come out here without nothing, I didn't think you would make it. Granny. But after I thought it over, once you set your mind to something, you would do it or kill yourself trying. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. I'm stubborn. I wonder where did I get that from? I don't know. It must have been the milkman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 When Granny came, it was so fun because I've really been missing her. And um, 
when she came, she was like all sweet and happy and stuff. And it was just so fun to get a taste of home. Thank you, Granny. And to everybody back home, I said, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm. You're my sweet God. It almost made me cry when she left. But she brought me a whole lot of good birthday presents and things. After five weeks, our school term has come to an end. In the 1880s, students frequently entertained their community with recitations and songs at the end of the year. Today, our children celebrate their accomplishments. We just want to share with you some of the many things that we have been doing for the last four and a half weeks. Bows and arrows, bows and arrows, cowboy hats, cowboy hats. Boys are going hunting, boys are going hunting, frontier house, frontier house. Work, 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 work. Riding horses, riding horses, in a dress, in a dress. Eating beans and cornbread, eating beans and cornbread. Frontier house, frontier house. More than just skills, but they've really learned, I think, responsibility and maturity and, and learned even about relationships and getting along with other people. You know, I'm proud of the children. I'm proud of them coming out here. I'm proud of them hanging in there. I'm glad that they were able to take it, and now they're better human beings as a result of it. I think probably just being able to see that not everything's, you know, served up on a silver platter sometimes. I think that's a pretty valuable lesson. One of the neat things I think came out of it was the kids ended up gelling. They ended up coming together because before the school there was kind of a division between, you know, the Clune kids and the Glenn kids. As is generally the case, the um, the kids are always the first one to mend, mend the fences when the, when the parents have disagreements. Having learned from the children's experience, Karen initiates a get-together. The women meet at the Brooks Cabin for a traditional sewing circle. Hi, ladies. Hey, how, how you doing? doing? Good. Welcome. <laughs> I had a breath. I ran most of the way. Oh, did you? Oh, I'm doing well. Your ginger looks quite good. Thank you. It rose real nicely. Thank you. Yeah. Everything's yeah. petite yeah. and very dainty. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You know, your cups are these great big size. You got this cute little coffee pot, and ours are like opposite. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's big. It's neat. This is the first time we've got, gotten together to do right. anything like this. But that's why I mentioned and it. And I didn't want to miss it. Well, I'm starting to make her a petticoat, which is one of those female skills, which I have none of. <laughs> it's real hard sometimes. You know, I go to Adrian and Gordon's cabin, and she's made these lovely curtains, and uh, it's lovely. And Kristen's cabin's so cute and quaint. And she's got it decorated, real sweet. And it's uh, my cabin's just practical. And sometimes that hurts. It just struck me as funny that here I'm practical and plain. And uh, back home, I was pretty plain and practical. So some things never change. I just wish I could have one day where I was the beauty queen. I guess every girl wishes that. <laughs> Just two weeks remain, and the lessons of the frontier are coming to light. 
I think I'm stronger as a person in that, like, if a tornado hit and all we could do was, like, live in the wilderness, I could do it. I think I've grown up for up here because it's taught me so many lessons. I think the reason why they did this project is because to see who can really live it and who can really survive the homesteader life. I'd say we're hanging on by a thread. <laughs> I wouldn't really like waste food or take anything for like granted because um, now I know what it's like to be without it. I think being out here like got me like really strong and I feel like more like me and Ani can walk in the dark without being afraid now and it's like I think it's a lot better. Because of how miserable everyone was, it kind of in a way brought us closer together and how much we've been working kind of brought us closer together and just going through hardships, the whole family as one and not being like all against each other, just staying as one. I never knew that we'd have fun games that would be fun out here, but back home they'd be the boring thing you ever heard.